Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining Foundry Live 3D Design for Artists with Moto 15. My name is Elise and I am part of Foundry's field marketing team. Today, members of our Moto team and special guests are with us. But before they introduce themselves, I'd just like to go and um, give you some quick Foundry updates and go over some housekeeping. First of all, today's session will be recorded and the link of the recording will be sent directly to you. And also we'll be wrapping with the live Q&A. So if you have any questions for our team, please add the questions into the questions tab on the right hand side of your screen. Also, I'd like to give a special thank you to our sponsors, Lenovo and AMD. We're working with Lenovo and AMD and our other partners as a part of our new program to test selected third party workstations across all of our products. And thanks to our sponsors, we're excited to be giving away a ThinkStation P620, a Lenovo and AMD Threadripper system, which includes an NVIDIA Quadro RTX 5000 to one lucky attendee. We started the Foundry Live event series last summer as a way to connect with you virtually and share product updates and releases. This year, we're excited to be back for part two. And so far, we've hosted three great sessions. We have dived into the roadmap for Mari and Katana. We also reviewed the recent Nuke 13.0 release and had our research team talk about the developments being made behind the scenes at Foundry, as well as the key forces and technologies that are driving change in the visual effects industry. Last week's events are available on Livestorm for on-demand viewing. And if you'd like to join our education summit at the end of the week, there's still time to register. This year, we're also taking part in several industry events. Um, we recently participated in the HPA Tech Retreat in Spark FX, but be on the lookout for us at FMX, GTC, the Real-Time Conference, and SIGGRAPH. I'd also like to take this opportunity to mention Foundry is actively involved in the Academy Software Foundation, as we use many of their open source projects that are widely used in production. We have representation on the board, the outreach committee and are actively involved in the technical advisory council and various working groups. To be successful, the Academy Software Foundation needs community members like you to contribute code, get involved and help spread the word about the foundation. Visit their website at www.aswf.io for more information on how to get involved. And also Foundry has many learning resources available on our learn page, including tutorials, developer documentation and release notes for all of our products. Here you can see a few examples of the tutorials that we do have available on our learn page, but stay tuned because we have many more in the works, including a mesh fusion tutorial on the way. Also, as part of our ongoing initiative to provide valuable learning resources, Foundry is excited to launch the color management fundamentals and ACES workflow training created by Victor Perez and Netflix. For more information on the training material, join our upcoming webinar on March 31st. And finally, stay connected with Foundry by subscribing to our YouTube channel. You can either check us out at Moto Geeks TV or Foundry's channel. Um, and on the Moto Geeks TV, every Friday they do a brew o'clock, so you're welcome to join. Um, just, I believe I let Greg talk about it later, but I think they post them all on YouTube, but then there is a live Zoom call for everybody to join in on. Um, but at the end, we'll talk about that a bit more and share some resources there. But Beyond YouTube, you can find us also on social media at the Foundry Team or at Foundry Team. So with that, I hope that you enjoyed today's webinar. If you have any feedback, please reach out to us at virtual.events at foundry.com. And the next part of the presentation has been pre-recorded for quality streaming purposes, but we are all here with you and we'll be chatting um, and be back live for the Q&A segment. I hope you enjoy the webinar. Hey, how's it going, everybody? My name's Greg Brown, and I'm a product owner and a product designer here at Foundry for Moto. Mike McCarthy here. I'm the lead product designer for the design group here at the Foundry. And this is Foundry Live Moto 15.0. We have an excellent series of interviews and demos for you today that showcase some of the exciting new features in 15.0. However, before we get started, we'd like to quickly recap what we've accomplished last year throughout the Moto 14 series. Let me introduce you to Moto 14, not 14.0, 0.1, or 0.2, but the entire series. 
Every year, three feature-packed versions of Moto are released. With over 60 thoughtfully designed features and enhancements, Moto 14 is certain to accelerate your every day. From valuable additions to our powerful modeling tools to innovative rigging control systems, there's something to enable any artist or designer. This is Moto 14. And that's why this is Moto 14. Check the description below for links to our quick clips that cover each feature in greater detail. We accomplished a lot last year and we wanted to take two minutes to show what we produced across the entire series. 15 is the first release of the 15 series and there's more to come with the next two releases. And, you know, the theme for the 15 series is designing the future. This means a lot of different things. At its root, it, it means a lot of meetings between Shane, Michael, and I. But, you know, all joking aside, we have a lot of plans that required certain foundations to be in place. The enhancements to rig clay, empath quick cam, the new mesh fusion workflow, and, of course, the updates to Python 3 and QT5 are all foundation elements in this plan. So as the 15 series moves forward, it's our hope that this vision starts to become more clear to users. We think that we can redefine 3D content creation workflows in some very exciting ways. Um, do you have anything to add to that, Michael? Yeah, I'm super excited about the direction with rendering and Hydra that we're gonna be taking in uh, the 15 series and moving forward. Um, you're seeing a little bit of that with the empath features and as well as the USD features that we included in the 14 series. Uh, it's going to be an exciting time for rendering in Moto, and I'm loving it. Absolutely. And uh, what 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 do you have to show us today? So today, what we're doing is uh, I'm going to be showcasing with Greg Lunenberger and William Vaughn a few of the rendering and animation features that we have in 15.0. Awesome. And I'm going to be showing some excellent demos from Lauren Thomas, Ed Ferrari, and John Babaresco. Um, just to clarify, though, unfortunately, there was too much material in all of these interviews for uh, the, this, this session. We've had to cut it down quite a bit, but the full interviews will be posted at the end of the event on Moto Geek. So make sure to check that out because there's all sorts of great information in there. Yeah, for sure. And also we'll have a 20 minute Q&A section with our speakers, as well as some developers from the Foundry who were the main developers on Mesh Fusion. So uh, be sure to join in and stay tuned for that, too. Awesome. Yeah. And without further ado, let's take a look at these sessions, starting with Michael and team. I'm here with William Vaughn from New Balance and Greg Lunenberger from Pixel Fondue. Hey, guys, how's it going? Good. 
Yeah, so we're here to chat about uh, Moto 15, the latest release. So we're starting the 15 series and we have our 15.0 release uh, out, which is really great. Um, you know, you guys have had a chance to use it throughout the alphas and betas. Uh, what, what kind of things uh, got you excited about it? Uh, for me, uh, I'm always excited anytime there's uh, some of the stuff that's not like, you know, the, the big ticket items uh, like the like the UI enhancements. I really like what's going on with the um, the uh, the graph editor and the gradient editor, um, and uh, of course um, more work on rig clay and all the new mesh ops that are that are being introduced. Cool. Yeah, I actually really like some of the new mesh ops, um, especially the vertex map mesh ops. So there's quite a few of those that are new. Uh, it's not something I typically use in my everyday work for, for product type stuff, but it's the type of uh, stuff I use for doing uh, 3D art that I like to do, which is more motion graph type stuff um, or mo graph type stuff. And, uh, and like William said, it's just the continued polish and refinement. I think the advanced viewport now is at the point where it's just my standard viewport all the time. Um, which is great. It has some new enhancements there. And uh, Empath as well is like each release is we're getting some new advancements to Empath. So Empath is a legit, um, you know, final renderer now. I think you can use that for your final renderers. I think you could before as well, but now we've got an interactive camera. We've got uh, uh, a shadow catcher, which is important for product type renders and, depth and stuff field. like that. Yeah, uh, the depth of field. Yeah, the depth of field and advanced viewport is pretty cool. I think we'll show that um some of those things so yeah it's just it's a continued refinement and like william said um for a lot of experienced users like you don't necessarily jump into the new features you like the smooth rounding of the corners of some of the ui stuff and and some of the things like that so like you know touching up the animation uh, viewport you know the graph editor is, is a nice little touch there yeah. yeah, I think that's great. I mean, we're definitely trying to do that. Uh, we have a focus on maybe some bigger features like uh, rig clay and some larger modeling features, but uh, I'm very focused on the usability, uh, making it, um, you know, like I say, rounding out those corners so that in your daily work, you can be working faster in the viewport, um, not having to search for things, uh, which I think is really good. And the 15 series, we'll, we'll see a good deal of that uh, coming out, which I think is really great. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about rendering and uh, animation uh, to a certain extent. So um, Greg had some stuff to show about rendering. Let's, uh, let's take a quick look. In Moto 15 V1, there is a new feature called Quick Cam. Quick Cam allows interactive camera navigation during an Empath render. Empath is Moto's new path tracer. To check this feature out, we want to make sure Empath is selected as our default renderer. So select the render item and under the renderer dropdown, make sure Empath is selected. Now to start a quick cam render, instead of pressing F9, we're gonna press Alt F9. The quick cam window pops up. You can see in the upper left-hand corner here, it says quick cam and it's going through the different iterations as the renderer starts rendering. And to navigate, I just do as I normally would. Pressing the Alt key and clicking and dragging, I can rotate the camera. I can also pan the camera by pressing Alt Shift. And I scroll back in the middle here. I could dolly in by alt control, clicking and dragging, a little too much. I'll shift and pan over a little bit more. I can also hold down the alt key and twirl the middle mouse button to change the focal distance. So I'll see if I can focus on that blue skull in the background and get that red skull in the foreground out of focus. Looks pretty good. Empath will continue rendering. There's no quality drop with Quick Cam. All the settings are on full. There's no compromises made for speed. If I want to sync the Quick Cam camera back to the scene camera, I just press V to bring up this requester, ask me if I want to do so. If I hit yes and exit out of Quick Cam here, you will notice the camera is now synced to the changes I had made in Quick Cam. While Quick Cam is not a replacement for a fully functioning preview window, it is a nice tool to use while Moto's preview is being updated to take full advantage of Empath. Cool. That's great. Yeah. The Empath uh, Quick Cam feature, I think, is a, is a really neat one. And at the end, Greg, you you definitely you know highlighted that. Um, you know, this is exposure for an empath kind of interactive and full-blown preview for the future. Um, we're doing a lot with rendering, uh, with Hydra rendering, render delegates, uh, Hydra viewports. And uh, basically what we're trying to do is expose these things as we go. So we don't need to wait until, you know, way down the road to get a little bit of a taste of that. Um, so while we have, you know, the ability to use these things, uh, you know, with the camera and kind of move the camera around. 
um, we'll be introducing things like adapting, you know, and updating shaders and things of that nature um, as we go too. So right now, I think, uh, you know, as you showed, QuickTAM's a, a pretty cool little feature that exposes more interactive um, kind of workflows in MPATH. I, I also yeah. like that you can choose whether you want to sync the camera or not, that it doesn't automatically sync the camera. That, to me, that might seem minor, but that, that's a standout for me. Yeah, that's a big deal because you can kind of you can kind of go around the scene. You may have your camera set up for your for your renders already, and you just want to check out various uh, parts of the model and zoom in on them and stuff like that. So yeah, obviously you guys have more ambitious plans for um, a full blown sort of preview for Empath, but it was super important to get interactive camera rendering with Empath um, to motor users as soon as possible because it, you know that's how we're used to working. And we need to be able to do that with Empath and not sort of hack it together with the old renderer. You know, we start moving over to the new path tracer um, with our rendering in 15. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that you showed, Greg, was bringing, you know, adjusting the depth of, depth of field. And as William mentioned, the, uh, the syncing of the viewport if you want to. Um, and those were, those were nice little additions, kind of polish that Alan added in, uh, which really kind of make the workflow nice. Um, the other thing is, uh, if you do send that depth of field back, uh, we have some new um, in the viewport depth of field. So you can certainly preview it there and then, you know, take a look at that and have that in view depth of field as well. So let's, uh, let's take a look at that. I think you have a little demo for that. Greg here from Pixel Fondue. Here in Moto 15 version one, we can now preview your camera's depth of field effect directly in the advanced viewport. In order to set this up, I'm just gonna pop over to the perspective view and select my camera. Over here in item properties, you'll see a camera effects tab and let's enable depth of field by hitting that checkbox. And to set the focal distance, I like to press Y on the keyboard, activating the camera transform tool. And then I just drag this little blue dot to wherever I want the focal distance to be. In this case, we'll focus on the tip of our lion skull's nose and look back through the camera here. Now to turn on depth of field in the advanced viewport, I'm gonna press O to bring up my viewport options. Let's make sure we're on the advanced options tab here. And here underneath the anti-aliasing options, you'll see a progressive DOF for depth of field mode and that's set to off and I'm just gonna set that to on. And nothing happens right off the bat because you need a value greater than one in the progressive anti-aliasing uh, field here. This is a progressive effect. So you crank up that number to something like an eight and you can see that we now have depth of field in our advanced viewport. If I change the f-stop over here to something like two for a more uh, intense effect, you can see that there, and I can even back it off to like five or something for a more subtle effect. So now in Moto 15 V1, we can do this interactively and not only save some time, but if you like to render out preview renders in the advanced viewport, depth of field is a feature you can turn on now. Nice, yeah, that's really cool. Um, I, yeah, that's, that's, that's a great demo of depth of field, and it's nice to be able to have it, I think, in the viewport now. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's something I think people are starting to expect now. It's nice to see that added to advanced viewport. Um, I tend to render out preview animations in advanced viewport and rather than a low res render now. And then you just explain away to your clients, no, there will not be wireframe, <laughs> things like that. It's, um, but it gets, it's really fast and having depth of field there, I think helps with that as well. So another topic we wanted to chat about was animation. We have some kind of cool stuff on that. In the 14 series, we re released Rig Clay, which is uh, a really cool feature where basically any sort of rig you can set up and you can drive with gestures and uh, commands right in the viewport. Um, so I, this is a feature that I got to design a bit and uh, I, you know, I'm, I really think it's a very powerful way to work. It you know, removes all the clutter of um, you know, twiddly things that you have to kind of uh, tweak and push and, and whatnot. And it allows riggers to set things up so that, you know, animators can just animate uh, however that is. And uh, that doesn't mean, uh, you know, one type of animation or another. You can use this on any sort of setup inside of Modo, which I think is really cool. Um, and let's see, I think uh, William has a little demo on that. So let's check it out. Moto 14 introduced a powerful new workflow for animation called Rig Clay, which enables you to simply click and drag on components of a mesh to execute commands or scripts and to drive channels. This powerful workflow removes the clutter of standard controls in your scene, allowing you to focus on your animation. In version 15, the 2D model view now supports command regions. This adds more flexibility to the types of rigs you can create. Also, mesh operation nodes have been added for polygon, edge, and vertex command regions. These new mesh op nodes can be connected to command region gesture items 
bringing the power of rig clay to procedural meshes. The addition of these new command region mesh ops allow for endless possibilities when working with procedural assets in Modo. Super cool stuff. Thanks, William. Yeah, no, no worries. When, uh, when rig clay was introduced, uh, it did open up a, a lot of cool uh, control setups that you can do for animation. But two of the things that almost immediately I went, oh, I'm going to try this was the first one was trying it in the, the, the model 2D view. Um, and then the second was, okay, I want to start introducing this with some, some mesh ops. And, um, and uh, so when Rick Clay was first introduced, those two items weren't, weren't uh, available. But then, of course, shortly now, we, we've got them. So it opens up the doors even wider to, to what you can do with it. So at the beginning, we were talking about some workflow things. And while it may not seem like, I guess, the biggest feature, uh, we have some new features around the animation editor. And uh, while some may look at it and be like, oh, OK, this is a cool little thing, I think animators are going to be really pretty happy. We got a lot of feedback for some pretty hardcore animators um, that these types of updates are, are updates they really wanted to see. So I think uh, William can show us a little bit about that. Moto's user interface provides quick access to its core tools and features enabling you to customize your workspace on the fly. You also have the ability to quickly streamline the UI by hiding most aspects when not in use. In version 15, the UI sees some much welcomed enhancements to the animation editor. The lower collapsible graph editor viewport has been replaced with a new layout that contains the graph editor, animation layers, and dope sheet. The upper and lower toolbars are context sensitive to the currently displayed editor and the channels viewport has replaced the one that was built into the graph editor in both the lower collapsible graph editor and graph editor palette, and the graph editor viewport options menu has been simplified. These enhancements continue to improve on Moto's flexible user interface and have already impacted the speed at which I animate in Moto. Yeah, this is, this is awesome stuff. I mean, it's, it's a little bit of polish. It's your ability to stay in one place and do all your animation. And again, you know, Mark uh, really did a great job on this, um, tying in the, the channels view and allowing you to kind of work in those two modes, which I think is really great. Um, and then following up with some of the stuff in 14 series where you got like, you know, the, the stacked curve view and a few other things that really make animation a, a lot easier. Yeah, I'm finding that I'm just, I'm not doing as much clicking to open up windows, to go to different UIs, just being able to work in one UI and access everything, but then also quickly hide it um, so that I can just focus on what I want to focus on. Uh, again, um, it seems trivial, but when you're actually working, it's those kind of things that um, that do improve and enhance your, your time in the software. Yeah, yeah I'm excited great. about the 15 series. Uh, this is obviously just the start. And uh, you know the, the rest of the year is going to be really exciting. We're going to come out with some amazing stuff. Um, I want to thank you guys for doing these demos, for coming and talking with us and, you know, uh, really your passion about the product um, and the art that you guys make. It's, it's so incredible and I think inspiring. Uh, both of you guys also are putting out so much great training material to uh, help the community and help artists that use Moto. Um, and I just, I can't thank you enough for that. Yeah, ha yeah, happy to do it. It's fun being part of the, the Moto community and and helping to, um, even in small ways, help shape the, the direction of the software. It's great. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate being brought on here and and, uh, and all the things you guys do to bring the community um, into the development of the program and sort of uh, like the, the brew o'clocks on Friday, I think are a great addition. <laughs> it's nice just to have some community interaction. Um, it's tough nowadays with the community being dispersed among so many different platforms to sort of, it's nice to sort of bring them back together a bit. So yeah. I yeah. The brew o'clock is so cool. I, I mean, it's, it's so great to hang out and be able to get um, the ideas, the opinions and be able to see all this stuff that's kind of uh, happening in the community um, from, uh, you know, uh, across everywhere. Uh, it's really cool. So if people haven't gotten a chance to check that out, do go check out, uh, you know, on the Moto Geeks, um, YouTube page and, uh, you know, check out the brew clocks. Well, thanks again, guys. Uh, I guess we should go and enjoy some Moto 15. All right. Thanks, Michael. Right. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. See you, William. Take Take good to see you, Greg.
So we got a lot of content to go over in this interview. Uh, we're just going to kick it off and start off with uh, a video from Lauren showing us how she uses Mesh Fusion in her day-to-day -day workflows. Sometimes I like to use a plane or a curved surface to give myself accurate and consistent bite line geometry that adheres to a last. So you can see that I have a consistent offset here that I can adjust um, sometimes I need an exact number for my bite line offset. In this example, I'm using a curve to sketch out a bite line that is offset from the last using a plane. The bite line remains consistent, and I have a flexible and easy way of editing this should I need to make any changes. I can use these curves combined with an outsole outline that I've produced in a similar way to sketch out a basic read of my midsole. It remains procedural, whoa, that is not a word, procedural and flexible. Now with these parts, I can generate a basic midsole envelope. I've taken a few more steps with this shape by procedurally weighting and pushing this center edge with a fall off. You can see that the weight and the push fits within the bounds of the fall off. And of course, everything is still editable, including the original envelope. Now with all of these editable pieces in place, I now have what I need to produce a midsole buck using Mesh Fusion. So for starters, there's a lot less buttons, but at no cost to functionality. I'm pretty happy about that because I've been using Mesh Fusion since it was introduced. It's a powerful tool, but it's always suffered from a complicated interface and an excess of settings, most of which I ignored because I couldn't figure out what they did. Okay, I'm gonna start my Fusion with the envelope shape. Clicking on New Fusion creates my Fusion item, and when I click away, you can see that my envelope disappears. And you can see that I've also lost my edge weighting. So I'm gonna click on the Fusion and then enable edge weighting again. You use this select source mode to add to and select from your Fusion. As I partially demonstrated before, after you've used a part to trim something or add or whatever, and you click anywhere in the viewport to deselect it, its visibility is disabled and it is out of your way. But uh, I'll show you how to grab these items back again in a second. I'm just gonna use this outsole outlined to trim the bottom here. So new fusions are color coded to indicate whether a surface was made by a trim, intersection, or addition. And if you click on a surface in source mode, it'll select the source that produced that surface. So what this does is it centralizes the process within the 3D viewport, which is where you wanna be spending your time anyway. Instead of rummaging through your items, trying to remember what part cut what from where. I'll show my last step here, which is to subtract the last from the envelope, like so. When I click it in 3D viewport, the last disappears. And you can see that darker color there that denotes a subtraction. If I click on it, if I'm still in source mode, it will select the last. Voila. Okay, I'm turning off uh, select source mode so I can select the fusion to show you that you can still edit the strip width for your whole fusion the way you're used to. But now let's use edit attribute to select a strip item. When you do, a little head pops up, which gives me the option to override the default fusion settings for this selected strip. And I'll select strip width, then drag left and right in the viewport to edit the strip's width. Again, centralizing the workflow in the 3D viewport. And you can see that it comes with a nice little preview display of what my strip's gonna look like. So it's just a lot more responsive. I'll do the same to the profile as well. So now what I'm left with is a completely editable buck shape made from three simple pieces. This is an asset that I could easily turn into a shareable assembly to use with different starter elements or to share with my colleagues.
So let me show you a couple of ways we can use curves. Uh, in this case, we're using Bezier splines, or Bezier curves. And uh, I'm just going to take this front one here, and I'm just going to do a straight subtractive trim with it. So I'm going to, uh, let's see, this, this guy right here, and uh, hold down the control, and click on the helmet primary, and then uh, just sub click on the subtractive trim button there. Now, I don't see anything. I don't see anything happening at first. In a lot of cases, I found you the bat, you can see it's it's there, but it's uh, kind of at the wrong angle. So I'm going to go to my You can see that I, you can see that I have see that darker color. So now what I'm left with is a completely editable buck shape made from three simple pieces. This is an asset that I could easily turn into a shareable assembly to use with different starter elements or to share with my colleagues. So let me show you a couple of ways we can use curves. Uh, in this case, we're using Bezier splines, or Bezier curves. And uh, I'm just going to take this front one here, and I'm just going to do a straight subtractive trim with it. So I'm going to, uh, let's see, this, this guy right here, and uh, hold down the control, and click on the helmet primary, and then uh, just sub click on the subtractive trim button there. Now, I don't see anything happening at first. In a lot of cases, I found you have to make some minor adjustments to uh, make it show up. So I'm going to select the uh, front, the lower front curve vent there. And uh, I'm going to adjust a couple of settings right here. One is the extrude along the surface normal. And the other one is the uh, ex manual extrusion depth. Because sometimes default just doesn't uh, work for you, so you want to use manual. And, uh, and you might find that you have to adjust the amount of the depth. For our purposes, 100 millimeters is working fine. So let's try this trim. In models of this sort, uh, this process uh, works fine for the most part. However, uh, what we notice here is that you have a pretty use with different starter elements or to share with my colleagues. So let me show you a couple of ways we can use curves. Uh, in this case, we're using Bezier splines, or Bezier curves. And uh, I'm just going to take this front one here, and I'm just going to do a straight subtractive trim with it. So I'm going to, uh, let's see, this, this guy right here, and uh, hold down the control. line geometry and pushing the buck shape made from three simple pieces. This is an asset that I could easily turn into a shareable assembly to use with different starter elements or to share with my colleagues. So let me show you a couple of ways we can use curves. Uh, in this case, we're using Bezier splines, or Bezier curves. And uh, I'm just going to take this front one here, and I'm just going to do a straight subtractive trim with it. So I'm going to, uh, let's see, 
the, this, this guy right here and uh, hold down the control and click on the helmet primary and then uh, just sub click on the subtractive trim button there. Now I don't see anything happening at first and a lot of cases I found you have to make some minor adjustments to uh, make it show up. So I'm going to select the uh, front, the lower front curve vent there and uh, I'm going to adjust a couple of settings right here. One is the extrude along the surface normal and the other one is the uh, ex manual extrusion depth because sometimes default just doesn't uh, work for you so you want to use manual and uh, and you might find that you have to adjust the amount of the depth for our purposes 100 millimeters is working fine so let's try this trim in models of this sort, uh, this process uh, works fine for the most part. However, uh, what we notice here is that you have a pretty much set draft angle and there's not a lot of control you have over it just by using a straight extrude. Now, what I wanna do is actually control the angle of the vent intrusions. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this guy here, this lower middle guy, and I'm going to add a procedural operation. So I'm going to open up the stack here. I'm going to select the uh, front, the lower front curve vent there. And uh, I'm going to adjust a couple of settings right here. One is the extrude along the surface normal. And the other one is the uh, ex manual extrusion depth. Because sometimes default just doesn't uh, work for you. So you want to use manual. And, uh, and you might find that you have to adjust the amount of the depth. For our purposes, 100 millimeters is working fine. So let's try this trim. In models of this sort, uh, this process uh, works fine for the most part. However, uh, what we notice here is that you have a pretty much set draft angle and there's not a lot of control you have over it just by using a straight extrude. Now, what I wanna do is actually control the angle of the vent intrusions and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this guy here, this lower middle guy, and I'm going to add a procedural operation. So I'm going to open up the stack here and uh, the operation I'm going to add is called the curve sweep. All right. So I've added that curve sweep, but the curve sweep also needs a path to know what, uh, what to sweep along. So I already have a path built in there. You can barely see it sticking out of the surface there. And in fact, I just might uh, turn off the fusion item for now so we can see this a little bit better. And uh, I'm going to go to path shape right here, add path. You can also add it in the properties panel here. So uh, let me go over to my path lower center right there. Double click on that and there it is. So right off the bat, you can see it's, it's there, but it's uh, kind of at the wrong angle. So I'm going to to go to my uh, curve sweep settings there. If I go near the top where it says align right there, I'm gonna uncheck that, okay? And it's much more closely aligned to the curve that I have set there, and I think uh, that's fine for now. We can also make adjustments to the extrusion angle by adjusting the path of which it's extruding along. And uh, I can show you that real quick. If I click on this uh, center path here, go to polygon mode, if I click on that, now I can control the draft angle this way. Click on this uh, center path here, go to polygon mode. If I click on that, now I can control the draft angle this way, okay? But another cool way of controlling this draft angle is by uh, tapering it and using the uh, procedural operations here in this sweep curve. You'll notice down here at the bottom you have gradients. We have a twist and a scale gradient right here. And I'm going to adjust the scale gradient of this uh, extrusion. And I'll do that by going to the, uh, to the gradient editor, which I like using better than these. Uh, so with that highlighted, go down near the bottom, you will see the scale gradient. And of course I need a second uh, keyframe to make this work for me. So I'm going to mouse over just above the, the little measurement numbers there and just uh, click right there. I suppose you can click also in this band as well. So. I have a keyframe there at 100%. That's 100% of this curve. And I'm going to zoom out a little bit so I can uh, see where I'm going to move this. And I'm going to move it in a negative direction. So I'm going to just drop that down. As you can see, as I drop that down, we get a nice taper. All right. Yeah. And uh, maybe I want to click this and control the node handles there, the uh, 
keyframe handles. And yeah, get that sort of a shape. All right, so I'm gonna live with that. And uh, let's go to the fusion item. Let's go ahead and apply this as a subtractive trim. So I'm going to go to this vent lower center item there, and I'm going to hold down the control key, hit the helmet primary there, and uh, click on subtract. Give it a second, and there it is. And of course, while this is live, I can still make adjustments to this. Let's go to the lower center, go to polygons, and click on that. And let me just bring this over a little bit more. Yeah. So as you can see, using procedurals is a great method of getting control over the various draft angles. Very cool. Here I have a Bezier curve. Uh, it's the Foundry F dot logo, and uh, it consists of some sharp angles and uh, the, the dot, which is just a circle with no sharp angles. Um, so I'm just going to work to the point where I can show off uh, kind of the new feature in Moto 15, the uh, strip per intersection. So everything I'm about to do is uh, basically available in Moto uh, 14.2. I'm going to select this uh, cylinder, uh, create a new fusion item. And then I'm going to select my uh, item with the Bezier curve, and I'll shift select the primary. But before I do that, I have to select the fusion item and make sure I have uh, select source mode enabled. So I'll select the primary, and then I'll uh, shift or control click on the Bezier item, and I'll just apply primary. And what that does is it creates this kind of wall effect. So we're getting this embossing effect. Uh, now, we have a little open area here, and there's no cap, but we can definitely solve that. Let me just enable wireframe. Uh, so I'm going to use this uh, cap geometry, uh, which is just this kind of uh, slightly rounded cylinder, uh, to, to create the, the cap. Uh, but before I do that, I need the, uh, these walls here to uh, intersect with this cap geometry. So I'll come over to the uh, Bezier curve item, and I'll enable manual extrusion depth, and then I'll bump the extrusion depth up to 400 millimeters uh, from the default 100. Um, we're not getting anything poking through, but even if we were, the cap geometry would uh, handle that. So with the uh, cap geometry selected, I'll shift select uh, the wall here, uh, and that will select the item with the bezier. And the reason I was able to select the geometry in the viewport is because we have select source mode enabled. So that's new to Moto 15. Um, so with both of these selected, I'll just choose apply uh, intersect trim. And it looks like it worked on the dot, um, so now we're getting that nice cap created by the uh, intersecting geometry, uh, but it's not intersecting uh, the F. Uh, now I happen to know that if we were to um, select the, uh, the curve here and move it around a little bit, it would, it would work, but something else that will work is just enabling sharp Bezier corners. And what that will do is it will actually create a strip anywhere there's a sharp corner on our Bezier curve, because um, currently it's not creating a strip. Uh, perpendicular to the curve or uh, vertically. So before I do that, I'm going to change the Bezier corner angle from 45 degrees, which is the default, to 11.25, which is a quarter of uh, 45 degrees. Um, and what that does is it just uh, makes a, a sharp corner at uh, you know a less a lesser threshold. Um, so now here we have all of our strips. Uh, now here is that feature that is new to 15 uh, that I think is a huge deal. It's the strip per intersection feature. Uh, it's new in 15, and it's it's left off by default, uh, which is, in my opinion, um, the way I plan on working all the time. I, I want to leave it off. Um, so let's have a look at what would happen if we were to turn it on. And we're going to not just turn it on on the, um, the Bezier curve, but on all of the fusion source items. So we'll enable that. Um, so with this enabled, Mesh Fusion is behaving the way it did in all previous versions of, uh, of Moto. So if I actually... Um, toggle this arrow so we can see the child items of the fusion item, and then shift uh, click on the arrow next to the strips, you can see all of the strips that are generated. Now, this uh, Bezier curve is pretty simple. Um, it's not very complicated. And if you look at all of the strips that are generated by it, it's, it's pretty, uh, you know, it's, it's already a lot. So you can imagine if we were working with a more complex um, Bezier curve, we would have a, a lot more strip items. I've worked on scenes where you can have like almost 10,000 or a little bit over 10,000 strips, and that causes performance issues. It's just too much geometry um, 
for any software package to handle. Um, so here is the actual strips. And we're going to look at what this new feature uh, actually does. So I'll deselect the strips. I'll turn off isolation mode. And then on these fusion source items, I'm going to disable strip per intersection, which is how Moto 15 uh, behaves by default. And now let, let's again look at the uh, strips. So now we only have three items here. So you get a strip item for each uh, corresponding uh, fusion source item, which is it's really great. Uh, it still gives us the, the ability to uh, change the strip width on a granular level, but not a super granular level. So I can still change uh, just the strips that are associated with uh, the cap, or I can just change the strips that are associated with the sharp corners. Um, and you still have the ability to change uh, just individual strips, but you have to have the uh, strip per intersection uh, enabled for that. So thank you guys so much um, for the past year of effort. You're all very busy people who have uh, who shared a lot of your time with us and, and your effort, and I can't thank you enough. And uh, yeah, I, I hope you guys get some rest uh, within the next week. I know it's been a rough month. No. Definitely. <laughs> it is here guys. too. Yeah. <laughs> thanks so much, guys. And uh, we will talk soon. Later. All right. All right. Wow. I just love the new direction and usability of Mesh Fusion. It's such a powerful tool in smoothing out the user experience with it, as well as the new innovations. Uh, I don't know. They're really amazing. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, William and Greg consistently blow my mind. They've been blowing my mind since there was a chance that Firefly would come back, right? That was an excellent interview. It's, it's so satisfying seeing Mesh Fusion being exploited by these talented artists after all the work that's gone into it. As you can see, the updates in 15.0 can be leveraged in some extremely exciting ways. For Q&A, we will be joined by William Vaughn, Greg Leuenberger, Lauren Thomas, John Bavaresco, Ed Ferrari, and two developers, Boris Sikonofsky and Remy Bruet. But before we move on, let's end this portion of the event with the 15.0 release video to kick off QA. And don't uh, forget to check out the full interview videos on Moto Geeks after the event. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, everybody. Moto 15.0 has arrived, and it's ready to accelerate the way you work. 15.0 is the first of three releases during 15 series. With core updates to Qt5 and Python 3, new workflow and technology for the groundbreaking Mesh Fusion, as well as updates across our modeling, rigging, animation, and rendering systems, 15.0 sets the stage for Foundry's vision of the future of 3D content creation. This is Moto 15.0. All right, well, that was absolutely incredible. I'm gonna let everybody pile in here. And um, we're back. Yeah, the technical problems, it seems like 
no demo is complete without a technical problem. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Has to happen. Uh, the most popular demo was at a trade show where um, I had two computers set up. It was Moto and Mari, and mm -hmm. one computer had a broken battery, so I had it plugged in, of course. And some person from backstage came up and unplugged that computer. And so I get up on stage and I have oh, no yeah. Moto session. It was like 15 minutes and 15 minutes. So the first 15 minutes, I had to describe what was supposed to be on the screen. Right. <laughs> That's the demo. And then get onto the Mari portion. It was yeah. just, oh, God. <laughs> what you normally see over here. Yeah, yeah you see amazing. awesome stuff. It was, it was awesome. I swear it was awesome. Anyway. <laughs> That was uh, some amazing Mesh Fusion examples. It was really fun yeah. seeing those. And you know, uh, Ed, Lauren, and John were were major drivers of of that feature set. Um, I'm hoping uh, we can get Remy and Boris on here because uh, I, I I just I can't say uh, enough nice things about the work that they did. Um, I think Remy completed over yeah. 100 user stories and over 200 wow. bugs. Man, <laughs> jeez, yeah. It was an impressive effort, you know, and uh, the technology enhancements that Boris has done have been really spectacular. Yeah, I know my audio might be coming in a little bit low, but um, if anybody gets a chance to see John's complete helmet, um, John, I hope you're doing a, like a yeah. full demo on that. Uh, yeah, I will. I will post that uh, uh, on Moto. Hopefully, Alan will give us a stamp of approval and it will show up in the gallery. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hopefully, uh, Alan will get the stamp. <laughs> Super cool to see uh, everybody on this team where you guys, you know, really dug in on Mesh Fusion. You, you, you made some. some really out of the box uh, kind of decisions and workflows. And I thought they were really cool. I mean, John, to have that, you know, uh, line that, you know, the curve that controls the angle of the bevel, that's you all. Know, using using uh, procedurals uh, in Mesh Fusion is a game changer. Yeah. It really is, you know, and now <clears throat> it's so much more flexible than I ever imagined it to be. And it used to be early on when Mesh Fusion, I think I mentioned this before, uh, you kind of felt like you were walking on eggshells. You know, you didn't, you weren't, weren't a little sure if this was going to work. You clicked the button and hoped it didn't blow up on you. Uh, it is so much more stable now. I mean, just, I mean, it is rock solid now. Um, I had, in fact, when I froze out that model, I was really looking for holes in what was supposed to be an airtight mesh, and I could not find any. <laughs> it's like, wow, it worked, you know. And it was a, it was a fairly dense model. So, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 right. I was gonna say that's the first thing I do when I like get my output model when I like duplicate and convert the mesh from mesh fusion model to like a, a frozen just standard face geo. I always like go to polygons mode and then control click on edges just to see if there's any open boundaries. And I can't remember the last time I, I had like a, a non airtight mesh. Um, <laughs> I have to say this uh, now. William has joined us here, <laughs> Mr. Perfect Topology. Um, with Mesh Fusion, you really don't have to think about topology flow very much, for the most part. Um, it just it it gives you results. You know, it, it's I want to say it's almost a brute force way of modeling. You just you just uh, you know drive stuff into other things, and it creates things. And it's a really interesting way of working. It's almost a sculptural tool. If you think about it, but uh, but you know, I love it. I love that I don't have to think about uh, topology flow when I'm when I'm uh, contouring a surface, you know. So, and I think that's what Mesh Fusion is. The freedom that Mesh Fusion has given to me, anyway. Uh, Boris, can I ask you a question? Or uh, uh, can I ask you a question? I already know the answer to, but you'll answer it. Uh, how many <laughs> lines of code does Mesh Fusion have? <laughs> um. Something like eighty thousand. <laughs> eight thousand. No, eighty. I think it's eighty thousand. Oh, eighty thousand. <laughs> yeah, eight thousand's a so, word processor. <laughs> yeah, this is what happens when you uh, you have an artist working with developers and like I want to redo this, and they're looking at you like, sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> 
but yeah, I mean, it, uh, Boris did amazing work, and uh, as you guys mentioned, it's much, uh, it's much more robust uh, just from the effort of revising the workflow. And one of the things I want to emphasize that's emphasized in the in, uh, the expanded interview with Ed here is Ed made a really interesting observation about Mesh Fusion, and that is the notion that what's special about Mesh Fusion is the strips. Mesh Fusion is subdivision surface Boolean modeling, which is what I always thought that alone is amazing. But the strips, can you explain a little bit more on that, Ed? Sure. So uh, wherever you have your your intersect uh, between like the two Boolean source items, um, you know, Mesh Fusion does a good job of just. It's basically uh, just a a Boolean system that can accept subdivision surfaces or Catmull clock subdivision surfaces. But wherever there's an overlap, there's a strip, and you have so much flexibility with the strips, and the strips are automatically all quad. Um, the, the strips are just what make it special. So if you kind of do, if you, if you look at mesh fusion kind of as a reductive method where you start with like a, like a, uh, like a cube and you just start using geometry to cut away so that you can't even see the cube, you're basically, um, it's like a reductive type of modeling and all of your, your strips are kind of like just perfect bevels. It's just, um, you get procedural bevels that are just all quads. Um, so it's almost like, um, it's just like a whole different way of modeling really. Um, yeah, and, and the beauty of the all quad strips is that you can select loops in that once you've frozen your model out. And uh, if you want to, uh, say, uh, cut away, cut areas out that uh, you want uh, to have some different surfaces or whatever you want to do with that, um, you can select a strip and or, or an edge loop and completely uh, uh, just sever that from the rest of the model and then uh, do what you will with that section of the model, you know? Yeah, Christopher Hott just mentioned he, he uses it with QuadriMesher to get decently low geo results, and you can use, yeah. uh, there's a function there to, uh, to basically do uh, strips to, uh, to curves, and mm. uh, that actually produces curves along the boundaries of your strips. And so it's actually really good guidelines for your topology. It does very well with other auto topology tools. I'm not sure when it was introduced, um, you guys will probably know, but the feature that you can add strips based on the, the surface angle. Yeah. And to me, um, I think that could easily be overlooked, but that's a big one because I it used is. to use geometry to do extra cuts just to get those, um, those strips. Mm -hmm. And yeah. now you can do it based on angle. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's been hi highlighted enough. Maybe you have, but uh, I don't hear anybody really talking about it. And to me, that's really exciting. William, are you talking about um, strips based on like the Bezier corners or? Um... No, so like, um, you know, say you've you've cut into areas. So of course those cuts are gonna produce the, the strips, but then you have areas of the mesh that uh, aren't uh, created by, uh, by say a, a, you know, intersect or a subtract. Right. And, but you can add strips based off of the, the angle. Uh, uh, I've I've seen you do it in a bunch of your examples, Ed. Um, and and well, before kinda, we used to have to we used to have to add extra cuts just to get them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I I I'm not going to say too much, but it's very heavy on our minds uh, based on some additional observations from Ed, because <laughs> that's what we get. Um, and also, I mean, just really quickly, you know, one uh, that you know the the stripper intersection thing that was something because Ed had a file that took him 17 hours to load. Yeah. And this was a way to, to cope with that and allow people to add more granular control through steps. Um, I don't know who even waits 18 or 17 hours for a file to load, but Ed does. And so that <laughs> caused us to make another feature. I and like, John, I like the patience yeah. there, Ed. <laughs> and John uh, is the one who uh, suggested actually adding the, um, the, uh, um, uh, the mat caps. Uh, for shading, which was an, a great observation because we got, you know, uh, the same display almost except for the topology stuff between default and advanced viewport. And of course, Lauren's been throwing a lot of requests at us. A lot of the bigger requests from Lauren you're going to see in future versions, which I feel very confident in saying are going to be extremely impactful. Um, but <laughs> requests required more work. So you'll see them in a later, later version. <laughs> You are definitely not, but <laughs> you have great ideas. Uh, so anyway, um, so Michael, um, you showed off uh, Empath and Rig Clay primarily. Uh, can you can you give us a breakdown on, on some of that? Yeah, well, I was just kind of actually going through some of the questions. There was a question about uh, Rig Clay, um, and you know if that's like based on command regions and you know what's what's kind of going on there, and it is. Um, 
So, you know, basically, uh, we're not a big fan of just taking something new and sticking it on the side of uh, Moto for a feature. Um, so when we saw that we could kind of come up with this type of little more procedural or gestural workflow, we you know we built that on command regions. Um, and previously, you know, you could set up a, a region, and uh, you could click it, and it would do something, and that was great. Uh, so what we did is we just kind of made it a little more node based, uh, a little bit more procedural. Uh, added in a gestural node um, so that it would, you know, kind of work with the underlying system. Uh, and as I've said before, Mark Brown did an amazing job on that. And, uh, you know, people like William and uh, just a ton of others in the Moto community uh, have really been leveraging that. And then, you know, that was in 14.2, and now we've moved it into the procedural system, uh, you know, with uh, adding it to mesh ops. Um, William, can you talk a little bit more? I know that you gave a great demo on that, but uh, you know how that small thing kind of enables rig clay, um, you know, bringing it into the mesh op stack. Well, it's just the you know the idea of anytime you can keep something live, um, uh, that's a, a bonus, and being able to interact with that live mesh but make edits to attributes, um, it's um, it's kind of a different way of thinking from just thinking about using rig clay for animation. Yeah, uh, because it's great for animation for posing and doing things where you don't have to have all those controls visible. But the fact that you could have a live procedural yeah. asset that you could like, you know, uh, uh, artists like myself or, or anybody on the call could could build and then pass to somebody that maybe um, doesn't want to dive deep into the schematic or into a procedural stack, but want to be able to edit that mesh to get a variety of different um, assets from the from the single mesh. I think that's where it's going to open up all kind of possibilities because because of that tie-in. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. I think that um, like you showed editing the the last and just clicking and dragging on it, and it moves the way that you know the the rigor intends it to, and the designer can just kind of get the forms and shapes that they want. And I think that's great from deformation, and of course, you have their animation um, implications there, but. Like you say, uh, even with the, the 2D kind of workflow, you can create all these little icons and widgets on your object and you know decide whether you want it thicker or thinner or whatever based on clicking and dragging or even just clicking. Um, you know, if you had some, uh, some products that you needed to swap out different pieces on and things like that, you could package it all up and rig it up with rig clay uh, just so that it's very easy to uh, distribute to a team and uh, update and allow them to kind of just have what they need. Yeah, and then you're not asking everybody on the team to become a Moto expert. Correct, yeah. But everybody on the team can use Moto to, um, you know, to improve and enhance their workflow. Sure. So Greg, I think there was a question up here about unsubdivide. Uh, I think that one's flying a little under the radar, but yeah, somebody just wanted to get some info on that. Yeah, um, so unsubdivide, uh, let's see, where, where was the question? Was it in questions or was it in it chat? Is, it is in questions somewhere. Let's see. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Helen, Marcus. Helen, okay, can you talk about the, okay, can you talk about that unsubdivide feature in procedural modeling that flashed briefly on the screen? Is it that you select certain portions of a single model to unsubdivide and simplify them without touching the rest of the model? A, a single contiguous mesh that has been subdivided, right? And so if you had laces, like the example in the video, because that's a very long, predictable loop-like structure, and maybe it was frozen at a higher subdivision level, then you can unsubdivide that down to a lower level. So, and it actually does, um, one of the special things about it is that it actually does a very good job of maintaining the volume, which other unsubdivide tools uh, that I've seen actually don't. They kind of get smaller, you know, as you reduce the, the the subdivision level. So this tries to maintain the overall volume while reducing the poly count. And uh, another great modeling one that uh, it it it's it definitely flies over people's heads in that video because we have like what three seconds per clip to to show these features, um, but the new um, Boolean enhancements um, that is one that came from Lauren actually, um, which is the uh, overlapping mesh islands. So you can have multiple overlapping mesh islands uh, for for uh, standard Booleans, which is obviously very impactful and certainly will improve Boolean workflows. 
Yeah, um, I'll just say on that, uh, Dino Zanko uh, early on was doing some tests with that, the updated booleans, and uh, it is, it's gorgeous the, the way it works. It's really, really cool. Um, the shading looks really nice. Uh, like where, where coplanar parts are booleaning together, um, mm -hmm. super nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Another and, under know, the radar uh, mm -hmm. feature is just the updated um, uh, edge weighting. Uh, it's been improved. Uh, yeah, thanks, that's thanks great. to Boris. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, Boris actually uh, identified that too, um, and so it led to uh, an improvement in our overall um, subdivision surfaces. And so now, if you use a fall off um, when you are applying edge weights onto your model, the fall off is going to correctly interpolate across the subdivision geometry. It's not just going to go point to point. You used to kind of get a stepped effect, um, but now you get a nice smooth transition, which is obviously very useful. But uh, it's an interesting example of how. Mesh fusion even drives improvements elsewhere in the application too. Yeah, sorry. Um, being able to use that feature, <clears throat> excuse me, with um, procedurals for, I mean, I work in footwear, so using edge weights is something that I do a lot. And so um, having more accurate edge weighting combined with the ability to apply said edge weighting procedurally as you go um, really changes a lot of things for me. I, I don't have to break my procedural stacks as much. I can keep things procedural, procedural, procedural as well <laughs> yeah. for, for much longer periods of time, which, um, just makes me more flexible in general. And one of the things I had to unfortunately cut out from Lauren present Lauren's presentation, I think I cut out the dead bullions portion. Like you're you're talking about Mesh Fusion's <laughs> live bullions, and uh, that means that we now have you know, other bullions are dead mm -hmm. bullions, which kind of made me realize that the new Mesh Fusion uses the deferred update by default. You can turn it off; it'll be live. But that kind of means that we actually also have zombie bullions. So they're I like, like the undead bullions, bullions yeah. right? <laughs> and so I think you just created a whole new language for bullions, Lauren. <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah. Oh yeah, and you know what? Another thing that we had to cut out was the uh, the the new vertex stuff, uh, and Greg Lunenberger's demo of that. So we'll we'll have that whole uh, tutorial, which was really cool. He did a great setup with some cacti and the uh, um, yeah, it was I think using the particle item map or uh, at least distributing particles in order to kind of distribute them in a certain way and having those um, you know be governed by a vertex map, which was really cool. So definitely be on the lookout for that video that'll pop up on Pixel Fondue and other places, I'm sure. We did have a question about uh, Empath and its direction and if it'll be replacing the default renderer. Um, and that is certainly our goal. Um, you know, Empath is moving towards that. I think in many places, Empath is uh, beyond what you can really get as far as speed and quality from the default renderer. Uh, but there are other places that there are gaps, um, you know, that we need to make sure we have parity with, uh, with things like volumetrics um, and other stuff like that. But, um, you know, we're definitely kind of moving in that direction and uh, we're, we're excited about, uh, you know, empaths abilities. Gotcha. And we've got an easy question from Mateusz Lazinski. What, what, what is the answer to life, the universe, and everything? 42 or 15. Matt, we've talked about this. It's neither. It's mesh fusion. That's, That's right. the answer to life. Yeah. Of come course. on, Matt. Yeah. And uh, where can I find roadmap for Moto 15 and maybe even further? Wink, wink. Yeah. Sorry, man. <laughs> um, this is a window, though, into our thinking for the 15 series and even going forward. Uh, you know, the kind of ease of use tools, like kind of refining workflow heavily and kind of also simultaneously improving kind of performance and just user experience in general is definitely our goal. And you're going to see a lot of things build on top of the Fusion workflow. And Rig Clay speaks to this, for instance, because it gives you much, uh, much better access to um, to things that previously would have been overbearing in the UI, and now you can just click on the surface and modify a rig or mesh ops as well as as, as seen in the video. Um, so these things are windows into the foundations of what we want to build on. Um, don't let your imaginations run too wild, but I think you can probably kind of maybe figure out where these things are going to go. And as you see us release future versions, I think you're going to start seeing, um, you know, 
what we were thinking and how this glue comes together. Um, but we think we have an opportunity to really kind of completely like redefine how 3D content creation happens. And, uh, and we've got a lot of great plans going forward for the, uh, the future features and how they can complement each other. Sure, and I would say, you know, um, if you want more information about Moto, you want to know the direction it's going, um, you know, uh, w I would join in to the Brew O'Clocks uh, that we have. Usually they're every other um, Friday, and uh, there is always sneak peeks and stuff that is going to beta soon and it isn't quite there, um, and talk of, you know, all, all of these types of things. So um, it's a great way to be part of the community and, um, you know, hear and see all these this great artwork made with Moto and hear from all of, you know, a lot of these artists that we have here on the call and more. Um, so if you want to kind of get an idea into Moto's future, I think that's a, that's a great place to join and be involved. Yeah, so I mean, you know, with uh, with Shane having a, a a glass of whiskey or a beer, like you definitely that's your best <laughs> chance to get info for sure. Like, yeah. and uh, make sure you have one yourself because it's it's usually a good time. And it's yeah. recorded; so you can hold them to it. Yeah. <laughs> True. Wait a minute. <laughs> well, you said. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, yeah. As long as I don't screw it up like the last one. Oh my God, that was so uh, oof, raw. It happens. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Hideki uh, Masuda actually asked, "Will there be variable radii strips in the future of Mesh Fusion?" Um, I, I'm not going to comment on future features, but uh, <laughs> that's um, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff that we want to add to Mesh Fusion. Now the problem is how we're going to prioritize all the cool stuff. But uh, you sure. know, Ed, Lauren, and John, well, there was Hideki never anything. And I are having lunch There's tomorrow. Mr. Suggestions. Oh wait, well, huh? I said Hideki and I are having lunch tomorrow. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> all right. So you may get more info from yeah. John. <laughs> You're under an NDA, man. Come on. Yeah. Right. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, the, there's a lot of a lot of really cool plans moving forward. Um, and you know, Remy, we haven't called you out, uh, Remy, uh, here. If you want to say hi to the audience, yeah, Remy. Um, again, did amazing work on pulling all this stuff together. And Remy is not just a developer. Um, I almost I, I should be ashamed to say that there were a lot of times where Remy would pop would pop in and be like, you know what? I think this is a better way to go. So Remy actually helped design. You know the new mesh fusion workflow was not only an amazing developer but also contributed a lot to the design work behind it yeah well thank you and hi everyone of course <laughs> hello remy hey remy so yeah remy and boris uh have been uh, amazing to work with on this and uh and uh, remy has some uh some ideas of his own on what we should do in the future of mesh fusion that uh, you may uh yeah you may see and and well you'll you will see in the future i just can't say when i always try to say when and i shouldn't anyway <laughs> well so, you know uh, it's, yeah. it's this uh continued evolution of, of moto and all the tools in it and this for me especially mesh fusion that has really fueled my passion and it's kept it going for all these years because every time you know you, you don't want to get complacent in your work but boy some new tool comes out and you just chomping at the bit to give it a try and you do and suddenly it opens up all these new possibilities and so you know your results of your work just keeps getting better you know that's that's what inspires me so much there so i am You've been there, was a, uh, there was a question about the focus on the ratio between uh mesh fusion modeling features and maybe standard or core modeling features um and maybe you could speak to that a little bit greg i i mean i think there was we're, we're very excited and we're showing a lot on mesh fusion for this point release uh but or just part of the series um and you know we're I think we're all talking about it, and it's very cool right now. Um, but even in 15.0, there's uh, quite a few, you know, um, standard modeling features in, uh, in this release. So I don't know. I'm, oh, Greg can speak real quick, to it. I will just say that um, you know, Mesh Fusion, the backbone of it is just Moto's modeling features. I mean, all of the source items uh, are all of my source items are either Catmull Clark. Um, it's all Catmull Clark geometry, so it takes advantage of Moto's strong modeling features. Or it's like nowadays Bezier curves, which are you know Moto has pretty good you know Bezier curve tools. So I don't really see it as like um, one or the other. It's kind of like Moto's standard modeling uh, tools, either procedural or destructive, are both like the the backbone of, of Mesh Fusion. 
uh, mesh fusion uh, just like kind of speed lines the uh, where i would where i could get uh, to anyway like the the same endpoint yeah all the workflows blend together so well now that you know i'm doing yeah. a mix of um um direct modeling procedural modeling bringing things through mesh fusion merging those out of mesh fusion into another mesh item doing more things with it at that point freezing it and then maybe using some deformation tools or deformation rigging tools to the result. Um, you can really take models um, from and to all sorts of different places. And I find um, now more than ever, it, it's really easy to blend all those things together. Awesome. Yeah. And I mean, for 15.0, uh, you know, uh, Mesh Fusion definitely took center stage in the in the uh, the kind of the marketing video that we did because uh, there's just a lot of stuff in Mesh Fusion. Every time I write it all out, there's stuff not in that video. I even took it out because we just we had to include everything else. Um, but there are a lot of modeling enhancements. So Edit Chamfer, for instance, was updated. That was a feature that came out about a version ago, a couple point releases ago. Um, mm -hmm. Very powerful tool. Now it supports uh, actual rounded um, bevels or chamfers, and it can modify those very well. Um, also, the unsubdivide feature. Um, we added loop slice as a procedural modeling tool. Um, Taz is the is the modeling guru uh, behind the team. Been here since version one and made all the you know direct modeling tools that you see, or vast majority of them. And he's always iterating on those. And so it's rare to not see some kind of update. And uh, you will continue to see those tools be updated. Meshution is not going to be the center of focus. All these things are going to be treated very holistically. Cool. I'm just scanning through some questions here. See if I can find any other yep, interesting yep, yep. ones. Uh, let's see. Hold on a second. I had one here. It was voted up a bit. <clears throat> sure. Sean wants to know if we're going to see any work done on dynamics, particles, and referencing. And there was another gentleman, I think Alan, that was asking a little bit about this. Um, so I, I think the answer is that we are, you know, even in the last releases, we had a few particle things, and uh, I don't know about dynamics necessarily with particle item map uh, and stuff like that. And I think we approach these things in a more, uh, a little bit more of a holistic um, approach. So I, I think, you know, one of the questions maybe was with Alan was asking about, you know, fluid simulation. And what we would do uh, is approach those types of things and see how they benefit everybody's um, workflow inside of Modo and, you know, where we can kind of build from the bottom. Uh, so, you know, there are plans for things like this with those features you're talking about. Um, and I guess that's kind of all I can really say about that. But what you're not going to see is the next greatest, uh, you know, fume effects or like, you know, th this piece like this where we're just like, well, we're tacking this on and here you go, amazing fluid simulations for everything that you want to explode necessarily. I think we'll approach it from more, like I said, uh, a holistic fashion. Yeah, that, that's the perfect articulation of it. And, and for those who don't know, Michael has a strong background in feature design and production experience and a very strong background in particles and fur and simulation, you know, right? Yeah. So these are things that you're passionate about. And personally, I'm very passionate about sculpting. And, and, uh, and so that's another one that was brought up in, 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 the, uh, in the chat. Uh, these are things that we, we want to improve on, but we're trying to take as practical of an approach to make sure that Moto fits into pipelines. And, uh, and we're trying to make sure that Moto is success as successful as possible in the features that we choose for each release. But well, keep on expressing what you want to see, because that helps drive absolutely. what you decide to do. Right. I think uh, Moto's architecture, too, is, is evolving. And um, with the changes uh, under the hood, uh, per se, it's going to, I think, add to the ecosystem uh, that Moto will be able to take advantage of. In other words, plugins that may have not been available for Moto uh, at one point may become available. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when the, and that comes to things like uh, rendering using, you know, us looking towards Hydra architecture um, and, you know, potentially things with Omniverse and other things of those na that nature uh, could bring those things in. Um, but I think, you know, what we're trying to avoid is, um, you know, exactly what, uh, you know, I saw in some of the chat where they say, well, you know, if it's, if it's not getting updated or worked on, you know, remove it, which 
I don't know that we would, you know, just remove pieces of it. Uh, there, there are times that we deprecate uh, things that either we've put in something better or we don't feel like it's, uh, you know, getting used too often. But um, that's where a more holistic and core approach is appropriate because when you tack on, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, a phys uh, dynamic simulation engine, uh, then it only goes as far as that tacked on phys dynamic simulation engine. And when it's done, it's, it's kind of like hangs on, you could do some cool stuff with it. Um, so that's why moving forward with any of those things, I would take that uh, more co core approach. Thanks. Yeah, and actually we have a, we have a good question from, from Kane. Um, and uh, can we focus on animation and waiting speed? Uh, these are things that we are looking at. Um, you know, we are working with, uh, for instance, uh, Rich Huri on uh, his Ozone work, and that that is amazing stuff that is going to really enable Moto in some amazing ways. Um, and of course, when, when we talk about dynamics and stuff like that, um, we'd love to have more third parties develop more plugins. And we'd certainly, you know, help them, you know, get that into Moto. And we've done a lot of work to make that easier on third party developers, uh, particularly in the last release or two. Um, so that is something we hope to see more of, but we also feel like we need to focus on certain core elements to make Moto as robust as possible um, in the short term. And I think that's what you're seeing from the, the features that we do currently choose. Um, I am getting notified by the team that we are 20 minutes over, but we also we also had some some technical difficulties difficulties in the in the middle, um, so we do need to wrap this up now. Uh, but uh, please join the Brew O'Clock. We have the Brew O'Clock every other Friday. Um, we could do a better job of notifying people when it actually happens, and we'll work on that a little bit. But on YouTube for the Mo Moto Geeks channel every other Friday, you can subscribe to get notified when we have them. And uh, it's just a great loose talk about the things that we're doing behind the scenes and all the great work that we see from artists. And we have artists come on to talk about their work. Uh, so participate in that. And uh, we want to continue with dialogue. And that's one great place for us to do it. And we'd love to have you be a part of that. So thank you so much, everybody. To those who joined us, you know, William and Greg and Ed and Lauren and John, can't thank you guys enough for your support <laughs> and guidance that you guys have offered. And Boris and Remy, you, I, I, I can't thank you enough for the amount of effort that you've, you've put in on this release. And we just need to thank Boris for creating Mesh Fusion to begin with and yes, 80,000 nice. lines of code. Oh, yeah. So <clears throat> thank you so much, guys. We will talk soon and uh, hopefully see you guys on Friday, right? Later. Absolutely.